Peter Schiff. seats. I know a lot of people probably couldn't come here because they went to hear Ron Paul speak earlier today, and I can't, I can't blame them. But I appreciate um, everybody that, that is here that was part of this uh, activity, this festival that was, that was, uh, that went and listened to Ron speak earlier today that want to honor uh, the man, Congressman Ron Paul who is great, a great American. But I think, you know, more than honoring the man himself, I'm sure Ron would be the first one to say that what he really hopes you honor are the principles that, that he's been fighting for, the principles that are embodied in this freedom movement that he's helped lead. And I know he's stepping down from Congress, but that doesn't mean that the fight is over. And I, I am very comfortable or comforted in the fact that his son Rand is in the U.S. Senate. And I know there are a lot of people who were part of the Ron Paul movement, Liberty movement, who were upset at Rand. Uh, they thought, oh, well, you know, he's sold out. He endorsed Mitt Romney. Believe me, it wasn't an enthusiastic endorsement. He kind of did what he had to do. He is a U.S. Senator. He is a member of the Republican Party. And he made a lot of promises to get elected, and I'm, we're glad that he's there. And the fact that he had to, you know, settle for the lesser of the two evils, it's a small price to pay to gain some influence within that party. Because we're going to need a lot of influence in the Republican Party. Because, you're correct, there's not much difference between Romney and Obama. And of course, I'm not a senator. I don't have any campaign promises to keep, so I can endorse Gary Johnson. I mean, he's he's the closest thing running to Ron or Rand. And look, I know who Ron and Rand endorsed, but who knows who he's going to pull the lever for when he, or not really levers anymore, but when he goes into the voting booth. If he votes his conscience, he'll probably vote for Gary Johnson as well. But... The key, I think, to this movement, and probably a reason uh, to prefer uh, Mitt Romney over Barack Obama, and again, it is the lesser of two evils, but you know, if we're gonna have two evils, we might as well go with the lesser. But the reason is I, we're going to have a collapse. We're going to have an economic collapse. In fact, that's the subject of my book that's right over there. But we're, this crash is coming and is probably going to come within the term of whoever wins this next election. And I think it's important that at least we have somebody who has an open mind to the free, to capitalism, to liberty. I think Barack Obama doesn't believe in any of the principles upon which this nation was founded, doesn't even understand those principles. And in fact, I think he is very skeptical of capitalism. And he is looking to capitalize on any economic failures that he can somehow blame capitalism for. And so whenever something goes wrong, Barack Obama is going to look at that as vindication of, of his ideas and his belief that the only reason that socialism hasn't worked is because the wrong people haven't tried it. And he believes that he knows enough that it'll work if only given a chance. And so if we have this economic crash and Obama is the president, then you know what's gonna happen. And we can't afford, the nation can't survive another round of government stimulus because it'll be lethal, it'll be toxic. At least if we've got Romney in office when it hits the fan. And if you've got people like Rand Paul and a few other good people who are being elected, 
lot, you know, thanks in large part to the help of a lot of people in the liberty movement, in the Ron Paul movement. I know the media doesn't like to give us enough credit. They like to blame, you know, they, they like to care, credit other factors. There's some good candidates now in the Republican Party, both for the Senate race and House seats, that probably wouldn't have got the nominations without the hard work of a lot of people in the Ron Paul movement. But... It's, it's important because if, if Romney is president, he will at least have an open mind. I mean, I think he believes in capitalism. He might not understand it, but he probably believes in it. And I think that given the right circumstances with enough at stake that he could be persuaded to do the right thing. As I said, I think Obama is a lost cause, but I think there is some hope that we can make some headway uh, with, with Romney. But I think what's very important that we have to do as a movement is to get people to understand that electing Romney, assuming that Romney gets elected, there are a lot of Republicans who think all we have to do is elect Romney, cut taxes, and everything is going to be great. It's not going to be great. We're going to have a disaster even if we elect Romney. The only difference is if we elect Romney, we maybe have a chance of getting out of it, and that's only if he abandons the policies he's advocating now and listens to reason. Because Romney, you know, as much as he wants to talk now about limited government, he wants to talk about making government smaller, he doesn't really want to make it smaller. He wants to expand, he doesn't want to cut anything out of the entitlements, he wants to spend more on Social Security, he wants to spend more on Medicare, he wants to spend more on national defense, he wants to grow the budget. In fact, what makes me so upset when I hear a lot of the Republican arguing against the Democrats now, it's come down to the the Republicans are now attacking the Democrats because they say the Democrats want to cut Medicare. I mean, we've lost the ideological battle when we're attacking the left because they want to reduce the size of one of the biggest government programs out there, even though they don't really want to do that. There are no real Republicans coming out there and saying that they want to reduce these programs. They don't want to, they don't want to tell the truth because they, they don't want to risk not getting elected. Everybody wants to buy the votes of the people who are living off of the government. And you have that, that, um, that, that problem within the Republican Party. There are a lot of Republicans. I'm going to be at that convention. Uh, you know, for the next five days, I'm hosting my radio show from the radio row there. So I'm going to have a pretty good seat and I'll be able to observe what's going on. But there'll be a lot of people there that are talking about smaller government. Yet they're the same people that don't want to cut a nickel out of Medicare. They don't want to cut a nickel out of Social Security. Well, how can you want smaller government if you want the biggest government programs to get bigger? So, and, the, and the Republican candidates, you know, they, they want the votes. They want the votes of all the people who collect Social Security, who collect Medicare. In fact, a speech that was given in Florida about, I guess about a week ago, I can't remember if it was in Tampa or where in Florida it was, but uh, Paul Ryan brought his mother down there right, and basically swore his allegiance to Medicare. And he talked about how great it was that his grandmother depended on Medicare, that his mother depends on Medicare, and he wants to make sure we all always depend on Medicare. Now, I don't know why Paul Ryan is a pretty successful guy. I mean, I think his household income between he and his wife, they make about $500,000 a year. Why can't he take care of his mother? Why does he want everybody else? Why does he want me to take care of his mother? Can't I just take care of my own mother? And he mentioned that his mother plays tennis every week. Okay, well if she can play tennis, maybe she can get a part-time job. Maybe she can take care of herself. Why is the standard bearer of the Republican Party, this guy is supposed to be the champion, right? According to the conventional media, this guy is, you know, the, as free market as they come, right? He's radical right. 
Yet he wants his mother to be a ward of the state and he, he refuses to accept any personal responsibility for his own mother. And he, and he brags about the fact that she wants to live off the government and he wants to make sure that this program is here forever. You know, true conservatives, remember Barry Goldwater? People like that were opposed to Medicare when it was first proposed. What happened to those conservatives that are still Republicans? In fact, Romney and, 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 and Paul Ryan, you know, their whole campaign is, we want to get rid of Romney, we want to get rid of Obamacare. Why? So they can preserve Medicare. I mean, if you, if you don't like Obamacare, then why do you like Medicare? It's the same concept. Basically, Obamacare is just Medicare for everybody. It's, it's Medicare Plus. So it doesn't make any sense. It's ideologically inconsistent to say that Obamacare is a disaster, but we need to preserve Medicare. And in fact, mark my words, I mean, if, 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 if Obamacare actually, you know, is ever fully enacted, Although I guess the good news is the country will probably collapse before that happens. But if it were to happen, many of these same supposed conservatives who are so anti-Obamacare are going to be the ones promising not to cut it. Just like they don't want to cut Medicare, just like they don't want to cut Social Security. There were plenty of conservatives who were opposed to Social Security back in the 1930s when Roosevelt first you know, came up with the harebrained scheme. But, you know, they're all in bed with it now. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to tell the truth about Social Security. Everybody wants to pretend, well, everybody paid into this program. No one paid into Social Security. No one paid into Medicare. All that money was spent. We spent it on the Second World War. We spent it on the Vietnam War. We spent it on the Iraq War. We spent it on the war on poverty. We spent it sending people to the moon. Unfortunately, Neil Armstrong uh, uh, died today, but you know, we wasted a lot of money on, on, on that, on the space race, on all the things that we did on borrowed money. That's all, all, all that, that's where all the Social Security money went. That's where all the Medicare money went. There's no money left. When the government sends out a Medicare check or a Social Security check, the money comes from general taxation. It comes from the same source as welfare and food stamps. There's, there's no difference. Of course, the politicians want to pretend that this is something different, that people paid into it, like there's some account somewhere with your name on it. There's, there's nothing there. Sure, the government, you know, when they, when, they, when, they, when they spend the money, they write an IOU to themselves and they say it's a trust fund. But you can't write yourself an IOU and then claim you have an asset. If the government wants to spend any of the money that's in the so-called Social Security Trust Fund or in the Medicare Trust Fund, what does it do? It has to sell a bond to the public. Well, it can do that without the trust fund. All the trust fund means is how much money the government is committed to borrow to pay for, to pay for the benefits that they can't afford. Well, borrow from whom? Who's going to lend them the money? I think the Chinese are pretty much done with buying treasuries. I mean, the Japanese are buying a few, but the yield on them is zero. How much longer can we sell them? The only buyer left is the Federal Reserve. And, but they don't care because they just create the money out of thin air. So what difference does it matter to make to them what it's worth? But this real crisis is coming. I think we're going to have a, a sovereign debt crisis, a currency crisis. Right now, everybody is talking about Europe. Europe is the sideshow. The main event is right here in America. We are much more indebted than the countries that share the euro, and we're far less able to pay than those countries. The only reason that there is a crisis now in Europe, and not in America, is because interest rates in Europe rose first. Rates have gone up in countries like Greece and Spain and Portugal, uh, but they haven't risen yet in the United States. It's only a matter of time. Right? Just like the housing bubble couldn't inflate forever, the NASDAQ bubble couldn't inflate forever, what we've got now is a government bubble and it can't inflate forever. Eventually, and not way in the future, but during the term of the next president, hopefully it'll be earlier in the term, because um, the sooner it happens, the better, but this bubble is going to burst. 
And you know, as I mentioned earlier, what I'm afraid of, if it, if it if it bursts too late, that we're going to blame it on uh, on on Romney. And when you blame, if Romney is the president, and of course, then they'll blame it on capitalism, just like when when Bush was the president. Of course, the problem with, with Bush is that he abandoned capitalism the minute he took his oath of office. He didn't wait until the 2007 crisis. But government came in and they screwed up the economy, they distorted investments, they inflated these bubbles, and then when the bubble burst, everybody wants to blame it on capitalism and say we just need more regulations. And unfortunately, Romney is going to be the face of capitalism whether he practices it or not. And so if the next crash comes later in his term, uh, Obama might be able to say, I told you so. And so we might you know, elect somebody even worse than Obama, if you can imagine that. But if it happens early enough in a Romney administration, then it's easier to blame it on, on Obama, and it will be easier to try to actually do something different, to actually try um, the, the concepts and the ideas that Ron Paul has been advocating like a voice in the wilderness for over 30 years in the U.S. Congress. You know, one of the, one of the, I guess one of the things that we can credit Ron Paul for, whether they want to admit it or not, is they actually are going to consider in the Republican platform, they have a, a provision about a new commission to consider going back on the gold standard. And, you know, a lot of people, I mean, you hear the conventional media talk about it. I mean, you think that, that they're considering, you know, reinstituting slavery or something. I mean, people think that the gold standard is some arcane idea whose time has passed. And, you know, we're, 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 we're too smart for that. You know, we have a modern economy. We don't want to go back to this barbaric relic. Well, you know, the founding fathers, you know, when we went on a gold standard, that was progress. It's not like paper money is a new invention, that we came up with it. Paper money's been around for a long time. And our, our founding fathers were very familiar with it. They knew what a disaster it was. They lived through that disaster with the Continental. And so they were forward thinking. It was, it was progress to adopt the gold standard. When they wrote the Constitution, they put us on a gold standard. And by the way, they've never amended it, so gold and silver are still legal tender, uh, not paper. And we became the world's wealthiest creditor nation under a gold standard. It's only since we left the gold standard that we're broke. We're now the world's biggest debtor. So the people in the media that say, hey, the Republicans are crazy for thinking about going back on the gold standard, the crazy thing was that we left it in the first place. And if you remember, Richard Nixon said he was temporarily taking us off the gold standard. You know, it's been 40 years. It's long enough. At 43 years or something like that. So there is some hope. And, and hopefully what we can do, if we can understand the government's responsibility for this predicament, and we've got the right people in the, right, in the White House, and the right people who are advising him, then maybe we have an opportunity to go back to those founding principles of individual liberty, limited government, you know, private property, free enterprise, sound money, all the things that we abandoned, right? And the reason we abandoned them is because we had enough wealth. We accumulated massive amounts of wealth because we were free. And now we're broke. And the only way we're ever going to get out of this gigantic hole is to re-embrace those same principles. Because it is impossible to recover without it. Right now we've got a phony recovery. It's all social stimulus. We're spending more money and, and digging ourselves into a deeper hole. That's why there's no jobs. The jobs are never going to come. right? Because the economy can't recover because the government won't let it. The only way we can have a real recovery is to have a real recession. And a real recession, unfortunately, is what we need to fix the, the mess. We've got to let resources be reallocated, land, labor, and capital. They're all where they're not supposed to be. 
see because government has basically micromanaged the economy uh, through monetary and fiscal policy, and it's a complete disaster. And the only reason we're still keeping it together is because the dollar is still the reserve currency, and the rest of the world is willing to lend us the money and supply us with the goods that we're incapable of producing ourselves. But when the dollar collapses and when we have our currency, our sovereign debt crisis, that global gravy train is coming to an end. And the only hope we have of ever regaining our lost prosperity is this movement winning over the hearts and minds of the American people and Congress and getting getting people to understand, getting the voters to understand exactly the, the what the lies that they've been told over the years and getting people to understand what the truth is and get all beyond all the politics and all the name calling and actually understand how grave this crisis is and what needs to be done because there is no government program. I testified before Congress not too long ago about and, and I, the, even the Republicans kept asking me, okay, but what's your solution? What should we do? They weren't hearing me. My, my, my solution was you've done too much. Just undo what you've done. Get out of the way. Let the free market function. There is no limit to how much free people, if only government would get out of the way and let us.